board. So, um, a big welcome to you all and thank you for joining us. I'm very pleased to um, welcome our talented speaker tonight, Maurizio Uzami. Um, he's well known to those of you who were lucky enough to go with him to Sardinia on the MGS tour or to Umbria. Um, he um, had everybody scrabbling around wildflowers and everybody was delighted to, to, to have benefited from his enormous plant knowledge on those tours. Um, tonight he's going to pre pre present his concepts and principles of design via no less than 235 slides. <laughs> <laughs> Are we going? Okay, so that's a treat. It's a challenge. Um, we're, going, <laughs> we're going to do five virtual visits to five gardens that Maurizio has designed. And I spoke to him last night and we've decided that we'll do one garden and let um, him talk and present that garden. And then we will um, pause and I will put, uh, uh, we will have a, a brief question and answer session. And that will last for five minutes. Now, you know, we'll see how that actually pans out. There are two ways that you can answer a question. Either put it in the chat if you don't want to talk. Um, and just, uh, uh, it's also a way that we might find that a lot of people have the same question. Um, and Yvonne will then, Yvonne Barton, our colleague, will answer, answer those, uh, excuse me, she will ask those questions. Or if you want to speak, if everybody looks down at the right hand on the bottom of their screen, there's a little reactions. And in that reactions, there's a raise your hand. And uh, I'm gonna stay on uh, speaker view because I'm recording this for YouTube, but Yvonne will be chat looking and seeing who's got their hands raised. And at that point, when she asks you, unmute, ask the question, we get it done and then you lower your hand. It sounds complicated, I don't think it is. I hope it's going to work. Um, we'll see, we'll see how it goes the first time and then, um, you know, we'll take it from there. So Maurizio, grazie mille per essere con noi. Um, I wondered if you might like to start by um, introducing you and, and tell us a little bit about how you became the gardener that you are. <laughs> okay, okay. Start. And then, now, uh, you know, start and then maybe you also have to share your screen to get your presentation up. Okay, so uh, hello everybody. And first of all, thanks to Angela for in inviting me. It's really a pleasure to have this, uh, to have this opportunity. And essentially I became a, garden, uh, a gardener when I was really young because my first, uh, uh, my first plants planted by myself in my parents' garden. Uh, I planted them when I was four years old. And then my father had the idea of giving me a small flower, a small bed to plant my, to give, to, to make my experiment. And then I almost uh, stole all his garden. Uh, so every single corner was planted in a couple of years. <laughs> and uh, I became interested in everything related to nature. So, so not only plants, but uh, animals and env natural environments and so on and starting from my uh, maybe I was 14 years old I started collecting plants because I became more and more interested in plants at that time was not really not really um, easy to find some interesting plants even less in Sardinia because Sardinia was not a place of garden of gardens um, so I started tentatively um, sewing cuttings uh, from other friends' garden um, or uh, uh, making exchanges with other passionate about plants. And then I um, kept on my studies, but not with plants, as an architect and an engineer, and then decided to put everything together in just the profession I'm making now, which is the, a garden designer and a consultant for everything related from the architectural aspect to planting design aspect and so on. Um, so uh, I also had the opportunity of uh, meeting people from uh, uh, everywhere in the world. And it was quite interesting for me to develop those information in um, a relationship, uh, friends, which are scattered all over the world, but especially relationship in um, 
exchanging experiences about planting and climate and different ways to conceive a garden and to plant a garden and to maintain a garden. So uh, what's strictly related to my speaking today is, is also to uh, a point of view that I uh, like to think is always changing and always modeling itself depending on location and depending on uh, um, the character of the site, the character of the owners I, I'm working for, uh, but more and more about uh, the relationship between um, climate conditions, uh, the effect I want to achieve with the garden, so the message I want to uh, to pass through the garden I'm designing, so the atmosphere of the garden, and uh, and last but not least the plants, of course, because I'm born as a as a plantsman. We can <laughs> we can say that. So I use a lot of plants in my in my gardens, and I also put a lot of uh, slides on my uh, presentation. But I cut them down to four, so we have four less than the yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> which is a big deal, you know. Um, and if you want, I can start now with the presentation. Uh, Thank you. Thanks so much. Okay, great. Okay, so now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh. Okay, so it, it's clear every, everybody sees the presentation. Angela? Yes, we do. Yes, it's okay? Okay. yes we do. So um, I was telling to you that uh, um, I was born in Sardinia and Sardinia is a place uh, with a very peculiar uh, landscape. It's always changing and it's quite easy to find uh, uh, four or five or even six different landscape, which means different rocks, formations, different vegetation, different colors. Even if you have a very uh, short trip for 40 or uh, 50 kilometers, uh, people who was with me with our trip in Sardinia experienced that. So it's, it's, it's really quite easy to find very different environment and landscapes. And also in, in Sardinia, we have uh, um, a very large number of seasonal highlights. So it's quite easy moving from one side to the other, uh, to the island, to find a specific uh, beautiful moment and flowering of some species uh, um, of plants growing there, or even um, in the middle of summer when everything is more or less sunburned. Um, interest combi combination of shapes and texture. We can say that our landscape is really, really um, complex, uh, talking about volumes and masses and uh, textural effects. So there is a very clear hierarchy of levels and um, the contrast between the shades and the shapes is uh, it's very strong. So what the, it, it gives a very much character to our landscape. Um, coming back to the, the idea of a garden, I was telling you before that uh, garden in Sardinia didn't have any history because um, there were no gardens in the house, it's just small courtiers uh, quite often. And uh, at the beginning of the 70s, the development of an area on the northeast of the island broke the idea of this kind of garden I'm showing you now which were strictly related to the holiday makers' houses. So uh, they had to be bright with color and green in uh, the middle of summer from June to, um, to August. And they were quite often uh, created just mixing plants that were in flower in that time of the year. Uh, we no attention to um, texture nor the composition of the garden and sometimes with very garish colors uh, mixed together. So uh, the picture you can see at the bottom of the um, of this slide is a picture taken from uh, a catalog of uh, a really renowned uh, company that makes that kind of garden. So they were advertising those uh, those gardens uh, with this kind of, uh, of look. Uh, so everything is very bright green and even forced with that. And uh, 
on the other side here, you can see um, the kind of garden that people uh, uh, that didn't have too much time to spend in the garden or that was convinced that was difficult to grow a garden because it was too time demanding and resource demanding and uh, even money demanding, requesting too much money. Um, it was planting just scattered plants. This is an, an image of, of a fantastic garden, La Mortella, but I chose it just because it was scattered plants. This was a youngly planted area. Uh, but the idea of just planting succulents and uh, um, few scattered plants in the middle of a uh, barren earth, uh, rather than creating a garden more complex. So sorry, Alessandra, if I choose this image, I know <laughs> you're not going to, to kill me for that. And uh, on the other side, um, just reading the books, I had um, the opportunity to, to read or uh, the articles on uh, magazines like Gardenia. Um, I came across the images of the gardens, uh, uh, maybe the much sought after, after garden of the, of the world, so the English garden. And I felt suddenly that that was the garden that were speaking loudly to, to, uh, to me. Uh, because they were overflowing with plants, with those harmony of colors, and especially the use of color was really interesting for me because I used to draw and paint, so that was uh, uh, one of the elements that caught my attention the most. Of course, it was not really uh, simple uh, even to think about uh, mixing the idea of an English style garden with that Mediterranean environment. And uh, I, I make the, an uh, endless uh, a series of experiments in my own garden, and I'll show you um, now. Uh, but then I became aware of the fact that uh, what I was looking for was the freshness and uh, uh, the combination of colors and of plants that I was already able to find in Sardinia during spring. And I just had to extend that effect during uh, all the year round, but especially during summer months. And this picture shows you, in fact, um, a detail of um, a roadside. So you can see this gasoline station. And the mix of the plants is perfectly in tone with all the rules of textures and color harmony and color contrast. It could be one of Nigel Dunnett's uh, uh, pictorial meadows, which are quite in fashion right now. But I can show you a ton of pictures because I collect them um, touring my island. And it's very, very easy to find this kind of, uh, um, of beautiful picture of natural garden. This is, for instance, in the mountainous part of the island. And it shows you the wild peonies. This is Peonia morisi. Uh, which grows wild in the highest part of the island and is also the symbol of, uh, of our region and grows with um, wild spurges and digitalis purpurea, so it's another plant association. Uh, another roadside here with wild pears and lupins uh, or flowering of uh, different kind of wildflowers. So you can see that each one of those features can in fact be in taken as an inspiration for a wall garden. So both the texture, uh, the strong texture with the plants and the rocks you can see behind those cork oaks and the texture and color of the plants, all those elements were of inspiration for me when I started. So I tried to convey this sense of freshness in spring and this textural mixture of um, uh, leaves and flowers into my garden. So that was the, um, the aim. Mm -hmm. This is on the north of the island is a, a windswept dune with a very fantastic metrics planting and another roadside in, uh, in June. We also have, as I told you before, very uh, sharp lines and textural uh, surfaces because uh, we are in, on an island which is very, um, very strongly uh, windswept. So Mistral is our prevalent wind and blows very, very strongly. 
and shapes not only the rocks, but also the vegetation. It's quite easy to find uh, very wide expanses of uh, lentisk or myrtle or other Mediterranean evergreen, which have been shaped by the wind. So that's really interesting because it looks like a topiary, but it's not. <laughs> It's, uh, uh, I think, the counterpart of what James Basson was talking about, the goat pruning. So we don't have goats, but we have the wind that shapes the, those, those plants. So uh, the garden Alla Pietra Rossa was the first garden I, um, I worked in. And so it was my, par my parents' garden. It's a small garden because it's just uh, 1,500 square meter. And... Uh, when my father and my mother bought it in uh, 1974, it was just like this. So a very low gariga with a couple of uh, scattered almond trees and nothing more than that. And this is the, the first flower bed that my father gave to me when I was eight years old. And at that time, uh, there were no plants available in the nurseries because all the nurseries just saw, were selling plants for color in summer. So. Uh, mainly annuals or oleanders, uh, uh, lantanas and bougainvillea, so not really a wide um, choice of plants. And in, during the year, I came to change this garden, and that is uh, the look, uh, how the garden looked uh, um, maybe 10 years, uh, so 15 years later. Uh, after a couple of uh, uh, adjustments, so you can see this is the garden is a series of, of uh, small uh, holiday houses. And you can see here how the natural landscape look like. So uh, this is a picture from Google. Maybe it's, uh, it's July, I think. And you can see that the only small patch of green are around the houses. And it is also an area with very poor, poor sandy soil. And uh, it was quite difficult to um, to grow plants there because I had to change uh, that uh, um, that soil. It uh, amended it um, very much with manure and compost and um, especially with uh, taking care of it to have a, a greater potential for growing a, a, a wider extent of plants. So it, it's also a place uh, with very harsh summers we can get uh, four degrees Celsius for, uh, for weeks in summer. And this is how the landscape can look like uh, in, uh, in August after one of our um, hottest summer. So everything gets burnt. Um, my idea of garden is basically um, related to the um, archetypical idea of a Mediterranean garden as an oasis. So uh, what I try to do is always to convey a sense of um, freshness. So where the landscape uh, literally melts <laughs> outside me I tr uh, or burn outside me, I try to convey a sense of freshness into the garden because I, I think that gardens are um, also given to give to people uh, who stay into the, those gardens um, a sense of calm and refreshment and, uh, and pleasure. Uh, and because maybe I suffer really much from heat, uh, I don't like to be in a place that gives me the sense of being um, in a hotter, um, in, a, in, a, in a hot climate or in a hot situation. Uh, under the sun, it's my, night, it's my nightmare. So I prefer something fresher and, and shadier maybe. So, and those are the results of a very prolonged drought in 2017. And you can see that even the wild olive trees uh, were burned after uh, maybe six months of no rain at all. And this was uh, the garden how, when I started um, planting my first flower beds here. And my father, um, who worked in, our, in an architecture studio, uh, used to plant everything in rows, I can, as you can see here. And after uh, 10 years, the garden was looking like there. Um, in which every single part of this, of this design represents a part of an experiment. I had to experiment with a new uh, plant palette. Um, as soon as new plants became available, I have to, to try them, to trial them, and to see how they do perform, and to see also how they do. I'll, 
uh, they were able to um, express some ideas I had or how they were able to um, to help me to give the people who was visiting the, the visiting the garden a certain feeling. So that my that was my um, my idea. And the first part of the garden I developed is this corner that was designed as a cottage garden. So um, English and old roses and uh, perennials. Again, I had to cut down the choice of all those plants because. I found names of plants into the um, English books, and uh, as you can easily think, it was a failure after failure because they were chosen for uh, a, a climate which was completely different. Um, but also, I have to rewrite all those books because in a Mediterranean environment, the, uh, the dynamics during the year are completely different, you, you know it very well. And year after year, I started to become more and more self-confident in the use of plants. So that was my, uh, my first phase in the garden and was, uh, um, in, in, it ended up um, as soon as I entered at the university. And then I designed the, the second part of the garden, which is much more related also to a very uh, strong lines and more mm, defined shapes into the garden. And um, the first step was um, the construction of this small um, area with hot color temps that was also an exercise in uh, uh, the theme of the succession planting. So you know that English garden are famous for their continuous flowering and the succession of different plants that give that gave interest to, to the garden almost all year round. It's quite difficult to have this kind of effect in Mediterranean garden, quite difficult. It's more difficult because we have uh, um, plants uh, uh, that, fl that flowers once with a shorter time than in England because of the, our climate. And uh, also because in this succession, the quantity of elements we have to put together is much bigger. So everything becomes much, um, much more difficult to control. Uh, but for instance, I, I can show you here that this is possible because this is a picture of early March and this is the same area in May. And again, the same area in uh, November. Um, what I tried to do also in uh, this garden, Alla Pietra Rossa, was to give the sense of the season changing because quite often we don't even experience the fall colors, you know? So I try to convey an idea of uh, autumn colors just using a uh, color of plants that were flowering at that time and just some plants for um, coloring the leaf that were falling like the, like the mulberry tree in the, in the previous picture. Um, another experiment was given by this garden that was um, um, inspired by uh, Becciato's gravel garden in England again. And to, to make that garden, I cut down uh, a pine grove that was planted by my father 30 years before because they were just choking everything around and I didn't want them uh, any longer. Uh, and I created uh, this corner, which was supposed to be of interest in summer. So the first part of the garden was uh, basically a spring garden and this became a summer garden. The colors used here are white and blue uh, with silver foliage and a little, um, a little bit of yellow uh, because I felt that those colors were the, um, uh, the better for uh, summer evenings, so I, I wanted to stay there uh, during that time of the day. And again, here was the time for collecting some more unusual uh, plants. Those are the ecums for uh, Tenerife, uh, ecum simplex. And everything here is related uh, um, then to other part of the garden, so you can see through those small uh, um, breaks into the, um, the plants, the other parts of the garden. So the garden looks much bigger than it is in reality. And the garden is basically 
close in itself like an oasis. And the only part of the garden which has a relationship with the outside is this garden um, I created in the front of the house, uh, which is a water pool, uh, which was um, created to reflect the landscape and the colors around. I wanted to bring here uh, some of the shapes that were in the landscape, so rounded shapes of bushes and the contrast with the grasses, because um, on the bottom of the valley, you, there is a, like a window into the landscape, and from that window, you see the reeds and the grasses growing at the bottom of the valley, and I took them inside the garden, and they are evident especially at the end of the season. So this is spring again, and this is how the garden looks uh, by the end of the summer. It's not a garden, the summer garden is not a garden of colors, but it's a garden of textures and is more important how the light, you can see the landscape here, is much more important how the light plays with reflection in the water and the texture given by the different um, materials like the, the small touch of loam and the water and the, the wooden area and the plant is around rather than color itself. And those are the grasses that surround the water pool at the end of the season. And of course, there are some other small uh, um, areas, and each of them was uh, uh, given me the opportunity of experimenting with something different. Uh, I choose to show you this one just because uh, the mulch that cover this area is just the shredded leaves of the olive tree. So we do the pruning. Um, we just shred them with a shredder and then uh, use it as a mulch. And when it starts to rot, just we just take it and put it into the, the flower beds. It's composted. And then we change it with the new one. It has also a very nice color at the beginning of the, um, of the season. And of course, uh, uh, a garden of this kind in this particular place means that I had to um, find solution to a really wide array of problems because not only the climate, but also the soil, which was very, very light. You can see here for this picture that because the soil was really sandy, all the roots of the plants was occupying just the top layer of the soil, even in parts where there was no irrigation at all. So this is just natural um, way the roots grow in this kind of soil. That means that there is a very high competition and that the, the more the plants are vigorous, the more they choke the smallest plants or the plants which are uh, less vigorous. So it's a it's a continuous competition. And this series of picture I wanted to show you because it's the series of the evolution of the soil. So this is the, our native rock and this is the soil of the garden, how it looked in the parts when um, I've not worked in, in the past uh, 50 years. And this is how the, the soil changed um, and you can see how it became completely different, not only in texture, but also in color because the increasing quantity of uh, organic matter. And uh, I find that this process is essential to any garden. So when I start a new garden, uh, what I do uh, first is to improve the quality of the garden soil, even if I'm planning to plant uh, not really um, plants that doesn't really need a rich soil because I find that it, it makes easier than to, um, to keep them uh, in good shape. But also if, uh, if I decide to change the planting later, I already the work done and I, otherwise it will be impossible. Quite often it will be impossible. And of course, it's hard work, uh, uh, not good for your neck, maybe. And uh, the, amount, the amount of organic matter that was scattered into the garden was really high each year, and it was improving the soil. And also really important was uh, uh, the irrigation system. Um, you know that there, is, um, there are 
many, many battles around passionate about um, on the subject of watering or not watering a Mediterranean garden. And I feel that uh, water well doesn't mean dry. So if I want to use water, I can use it in a, in a, in a wise way. Um, in on the limits which are different from uh, every from garden to garden, because I can make a garden in a place where there is no water available, or in a place where there is a large amount of water available, and I'll show you both. And I found absolutely a nonsense to refuse to use water when it's available, uh, given the fact that water is a renewable resource, so it's not petrol. Um, uh, it fell down uh, every, every year from, from rain, and we just have to use it in a sustainable way. Um, so that means that we have a limit to use uh, the water, which is different in, from, from every, every location. And of course, this kind of, um, uh, of way of uh, tending a garden has also um, a strict relationship to benefits, not only in the people living there, but also in natural uh, wildlife, because it attracts a lot of uh, very nice uh, pots, I guess, into, into the garden. And uh, it becomes like a, a big restaurant for, uh, for birds and, and, and animals living around. Um, so this was the, the garden at La Pietra Rossa. I don't know if you have any question about it. Okay, so everybody, um, uh, Yvonne, has anybody, um, has anybody written to you? Amanda Kinsman wrote to me Amanda, I'm not looking at the chat because I'm recording this for YouTube. So um, I don't know what you actually said on there. Um, you had a question to me. Anybody else, Yvonne, can you? No, I've not had any chat. And oh, at the okay. moment we haven't got anybody with their hand up, so. Okay. okay. Can you name some of the roses uh, is from Anna Naismith to everyone. Can you... oh, there was a very um, wide selection of roses uh, uh, because I started uh, with the English roses, uh, but found that they were not really um, uh, the most suited for my conditions. So I moved to China's and tea roses, which were much better for my climate. So there is a very wide choice of them, a choice of them. And uh, to name a few, there was a uh, Archiduc Joseph uh, or General Shabikin, uh, Mrs. Dudley Cross, uh, the, the number of plants uh, of roses, the varieties of roses uh, that are suited to our climate, it's, it's really, it's really big. Okay, so there's, uh, I can see two other participants have got their hand up. Uh, I don't know which ones. <laughs> uh, Paola. One is Paola. Yeah, ciao. Ciao, Paola. May I? Yep. Uh, ciao, Maurizio. I was in Sardinia, the tour in Sardinia. Yeah, with, I can uh, remember. Which I like. And uh, by the way, I'm thinking of building now a roadside garden. So I will build a, a road through my garden <laughs> and hoping that the roadside garden will look like Sardinia. No, my, uh, my question is a, a, a little bit um, um, some specification about changing the quality of the soil because there are yeah. a lot of theories lately of uh, to, to not to improve at all the, the quality of the soil for Mediterranean we need poor soil. Yes, so I know. That yes. would be easier. Uh, <laughs> yes, but uh, thanks for this uh, particular question because I think that this is a, a fundamental point. Uh, first of all, I'm not convinced at all that Mediterranean gardens are just uh, the uh, on the Garriga style. You know, uh, Mediterranean environments are very varied, are really varied, and so you got, um, you know, what we call the forra, so the bottom of a valley with the river flowing. So um, the environment around that is made by plants that like water. And we have plains with very fertile soils. And we have a lot of plants that thrive in a very rich environment. 
environments. And also, um, we have woodland uh, areas in Mediterranean landscape. So there is a lot. The, the peonies I was showing you before grows in a very deep, fertile soil, not in, in the middle of a crunch of rocks. So um, I know really well the theories of uh, Olivier Filippi, for instance, and everybody knows me. Um, also know that I'm a little bit against not its own theories that I find that I find being uh, completely right, but the way his ideas are scattered and used everywhere, even where is a nonsense. So I have friends which are very fertile, deep, loam or uh, or clay, uh, and a lot of water, and they're, they're putting. Um, hundreds of cubic meters of, uh, of gravel into this soil uh, because they want to, to make a, a, a gravel garden, a Mediterranean gravel garden. It's a nonsense for me. Uh, so from time to time, we have to decide depending on the specific location. Sometimes it's good not to improve the soil too much, but more often, and I show you in one of the gardens, which is it made the maintenance of the garden much easier, and I'll explain you why. Okay. Can I just ask a couple of questions on behalf of people in the in the um, uh, on the chat before you go on to the next question from Delia? Um, the uh, first of all, which um, of the grasses are you? Do you find <clears throat> so uh, that, like? The, the only kind of grass I'm using now is um, a grass that came from South Africa and is the seashore grass, is Paspalum vaginatum. It is a kind of grass that can grow with very little water. So that loan I showed you before is watered once every three days for uh, 20 minutes, which is a very low amount of water compared to the more or less half an hour in, on a daily basis of uh, different kinds of loans. And if you want, you can either water it with 30% of salt water, if it's necessary. Gosh. Uh, and the second question on the chat is um, the, um, the olives, olive leaves that you use for, for yeah. um, um, to- uh, uh, As a mulch. As a mulch. Is it only the leaves or is it the, the no, twigs? No, it's a crunch made with uh, um, crusted leaves and small branches. We took the, the, the thicker uh, parts of the branches for, um, for the fireplace <laughs> and, uh, and all the rest of the branches with the, small, with the, um, with the thin branches and the leaves are shredded and just scattered into the soil. I use that too in my house. I use uh, it, and it works beautifully because it's a pale color. It's nice. Yes, it's, it's pale, nice when it's not. I mean, if it's ra been raining, it gets a bit darker. But it's a nice light reflective basis. Okay, so that's five um, five minutes. I know okay. Delia Delia Dumaresk. I can see your hand is up. <laughs> Sorry. Can I ask? Can you hear me, Maurizio? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, my question, which is partly, I put it, started putting it in the chat, chat to see if it save time. Uh, I live in Umbria. We're quite yeah. high. We're 600 meters. It's very rocky, very windswept, and gets very exposed to very dry sun and winds in the summer. Um, yeah, yeah. With a, a moment with climate change and incredibly variable rainfall that sometimes falls often at the very wrong time of the year. But mm -hmm. we have a lot of wildflowers. Um, Mostly, I was very interested in your euphorbias. We have a wild euphorbia that's tiny, and it looks very like the euphorbias I saw in your pictures of Pietro Rossa. Yeah. And I wondered if those are ones, yours are very much taller. I wondered if it's, if you can buy them like that, and if so, what the names are. So um, the, the, the tallest one you saw in my picture, I always, I also grow the ones you, you, you can find wild all over Italy, which is Caracas, Wulfeni. Mm -hmm. uh, but the other one, the tall one is a, is a um, subshrub that comes from uh, um, Canary Island and it's Euphorbia lambi. Lambi, okay. Yeah. Euphorbia lambi. And it's a tree, it's kind of a tree euphorbia. Uh -huh. You mentioned the other one, the name of the wild one. Um, the wild one, which is a hardy one, because the lambi is not hardy. 
Okay. And um, the other one, which is hardly all over Italy, is Caracas Vulfenia. Ooh, okay. <laughs> With the big green flower heads. It's beautiful. Yes, my, my, it mine has a very also yellow. also receives okay. freely. Okay, okay. Uh, that's how you spell it, is it? Wolf? Okay. Um, I just see if they come up on the chat how to spell it, yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right, I'm going to go, Thank you. Let's, let's press on, shall we? Um, because otherwise we'll, we're gonna miss out on one or, or other of these gardens. Um, so I think that worked quite well. So we'll do it uh, um, after we uh, get our beautiful visit to the beautiful Telti. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, this is Giardino dei Fontanili, and uh, it, it was one of the first big projects I um, had done in the north of the island. In fact, it was the, uh, the first project that had me move into the north of the island in a completely different environment. So you can see here the property in the middle of um, uh, Cork Oak Grove. This is the landscape. It's much greener because there, there are vast expenses of woodland areas and it rains uh, more than twice uh, than in the south of the island. The soil also is, uh, um, is not sandy. It's quite variable because on, we are on granite rock, so it's quite variable, um, but it's much more heavier than in the south of the island. So it was a different experience. It's also um, not a climate which is not hotter, um, it's not hot like in the, in the south because there is a constant breeze coming from the sea. We are around 270 meters above sea level. So we, we are not that high, but we take the winds coming from, uh, uh, from the, um, from the sea. And as you can see, the garden of this property was just uh, scattered plants again in the middle of a valley. They suffered for uh, uh, a very big problem uh, because on the upper side of the property, there is a flat area that become marshy during winter. So you can see those wild pools. And this place is called by the locals as Luci Kenti, that means uh, uh, the glistening place. So it's like the reflection of the water in those shallow pools during winters give you the, this, um, this effect of, of lights um, through, the, um, through the grass. Um, but the problem is that this water then flows into the garden and the garden was completely damp during winter and completely dry during summer, which is something um, not really appealing for plants or even for people working in, in that garden. So it's a property of two hectares and a half. And I decided to put again the garden into this valley because this area had the bad soil and was also not strictly related to the house because there is just this small terrace that, um, that tie together the, the house with a garden, so you discover the garden and you don't see the garden from the house. And the main element, the main feature of this, um, of this uh, design was this uh, small stream, this small river uh, that was useful during winter to collect and drain the water we saw before. And during summer months and during spring where it was not naturally flowing. There was a recirculating system from this uh, water pool to the top of the garden, having the, the stream running as well. And at the very bottom of the garden, there is the swimming pool, which is designed in the shape of a water tank, you know, for, um, for animals, which is a, a feature quite often found uh, in, uh, in the fields. And those are some of the, the first sketches for, for, uh, for this design. And this is how the garden looks now. Uh, now the garden is uh, 10 years old, but those pictures are uh, maybe on the fourth or fifth year of, um, of life of this garden. And it's a garden also where the owner is uh, really passionate about plants. And she asked me to have uh, um, a collection of plants of different 
kinds. Um, and you know that this kind of process uh, of collecting plants is not really often uh, a good thing for, um, for having a good garden. So good design from one side and a wide array of plants on the other side. Um, but they know th that I like plants, so they asked me to make garden with a rich plant palette just for that. And what I, I wanted to, um, to use is the presence in this property of different corners with different conditions, like uh, different microclimates and different condition of soil. So there are places with very shallow soils on top of uh, rocky outcrops. And there are places like, for instance, under those um, oaks here, with much more fertile soil and shade. So every area of the garden has a different collection of plants, which are suited for the specific condition. And so touring the garden, um, you can experience different sites. So the tour starts from the house, and in front you don't see the garden, which is on the left. You just see the vineyard, which was present uh, from the beginning. And then you take this, uh, um, this sentiero, this just uh, pathway through the garden, and you discover different corners of the gardens with different plants association, um, all really Mediterranean in appearance, just because the, the landscape uh, um, surrounding the, in the neighbors, surrounding the garden, and, um, you can see that. So the idea was to have that landscape entering into the garden and the difference between natural and cultivated is just the, the, you know, the shaping of some of the plants and the use of some colors that are like echoing from one side to the other. And spring, of course, is uh, the moment where the flowering is at its um, maximum. And this is the area uh, more, the more shady area I was um, saying to you before, where we grow also the foxgloves. But also the planting evolves during the year because this is a place which is inhabited all year round. So one of the goals was to have uh, always something of interesting during, um, during the year. Uh, not in flower, but of interest. Um, summer is the moment of rest, so the garden, because became uh, less manicured, uh, and we also um, water the plants uh, uh, just to keep them green and alive, but avoiding them growing during summer, because the flowers just uh, fries under the sun. Um, so the idea is to have a garden shaped in grays and greens, but no flowers. flowers. And then the flowers come again uh, with the rains of, uh, of um, the autumn. And they, there is a new spring in October and November with also the, the foliages of the plants because at this elevation we have a good um, uh, color in the autumn for some plants. This is a, um, a loquat tree, for instance, a khaki. And vineyard, of course, during uh, during November, but also camellias and other acidic lobic plants because in granite soil we can grow them with quite um, great ease. And those pictures, this one and the next one, are taken in January, just to show you that we can have a very rich, richly flowered garden in the middle of winter, just choosing the right, the right plants in, in this particular spot. So, and that was the Giardino dei Fontanili. I don't know if you have any question about that. I have one. In the last picture, the blue, yeah. is it a salvia? Is oh, it? Yeah. So this is a, um, a small border, which is right in front of the house. So it was particularly important that it was in flower during the winter months because it is in a direct side from the windows of the, um, of the lower level of the house. So from the kitchen and from uh, the living room. 
Mm. And this is a tegrum. Si, um, Alessandra ha risposto. She's, uh, she's, it's a fruit, it's because it's cut so low that I don't Yeah, know. but this is a, is a compact and darker variety. It's the azzurre yeah. yeah, yeah. It's okay. a darker variety. And, and then those plants here, again, in blue, those are the, um, the Algerian irises, Iris unguicularis. Mm. Okay, so they bloom in, starting from October, through all the winter and they end uh, flowering by the beginning of March. Funny. And the rose here is a tea rose, it's Lady Hillington. Um, it's a rose, like all the tea roses, they flower at their best from October to June. And then they go dormant during summer. They were widely used also on the Riviera Gardens because um, they provide flowers during winter when people coming from when, when the wealth people coming from north of Europe came down to enjoy the climate of the Riviera during the winter months. Okay, so Yvonne, is there anyone on the chat asking stuff? I saw Anne Meek. Hello, Yvonne, are you there? <laughs> okay. Yes, I'm there. Um, um, to, uh, for, uh, um, uh, Anna Meek was asking about how you change the water flow uh, on, the, um, on the property. And yeah. somebody also wanted to know another, uh, again, the, um, the name of the rose. Yeah, so the name of the rose is Lady Hillington. Thank you. The last one, the yellow one. Uh, that was the bush form. Uh, there is also a climbing form of the same rose. It's identical, but it's a climber. And uh, um, how we change the water flow. So the problem is that because the soil is, is relatively shallow, so 60 centimeters to one meter deep, not more than that, and then you get the rock, the granite rock, the water flows on the surface rather than going deep down uh, on the lower layers of the soil. And so we have to drain these waters to catch it at the top of the property and to channel it to one, just one point and that have it flowing in the, um, the stream. So that was the point to, um, to have it like captured on the top of the property to avoid it uh, just going on, on the slope and uh, spreading everywhere. And somebody else is yeah, but that, that's that's really strange because what you learn, uh, I'm a permaculturist, yep. is you have to keep this water uh, because in seven years it will gradually uh, disappear in the soil. So actually, what you found in your first uh, observation uh, when you said you had the this this all this water up there, so in this I was case, thinking, okay. So in this case, the water never disappear because there is a is not rain is not a rain is not the water coming from a, you know a, a thunderstorm or something like this is rain that is constantly flowing from the upper part. It's like a huge reservoir of water, and when all the upper area um, on the neighbor property became saturated in water, this water starts to flow and there is a constant layer of, of water on top of the soil. So it's like a huge waterfall, a very thin layer of soil um, going down to all those area for at least three months. So all the plants that my clients try to grow them became uh, waterlogged during winter and died because their roots were completely suffocated by the water. Uh, the, the, it was really damp soil. It was not just, um, you know, soil which is like waterlogged for, for, for a couple of days. Yeah. Um, Maurizio, we've got another question about water before we leave this. Yeah. Um, Cheryl Rencher wants to know that the swimming pool, is that filled with water from the natural source? No. <laughs> okay. It's just a, no, it's just a, um, I don't know if there was a picture with um, with some of the gutters. There were gutters on the, 
on the wall and the water looks like it's coming from the stream, but in fact it is a, um, a recirculating system of the filtered water into the swimming pool. Um, we have the, a very natural system of filtering, so no, no chlorus or no chemicals inside because the, um, the owner is, uh, is really allergic to this kind of product. Um, but we didn't find um, the possibility of creating, you know, like a, what we call a biolago, so a natural filtering system with plants because we will have need um, an enormous basin with plants. It was not possible to create that because of, you know, regular and local laws and so on. So we prefer to do that kind of filtering. And a final question just came in on the chat. Um, you, you're using your olive trees for mulch, but um, uh, do you have any problem with the Zyella, um olive fly? And, and does that come into your uh, decision making? No, uh, we, we don't have problems with um, uh, with pests, uh, particular kind of pests with olives. I, I will show you a garden in South of Puglia where we have a, a big issues with olive trees for the xylella. And mm. uh, this also affected the, the plant palette because there is an endless list of plants which are not allowed to be planted any longer in gardens because of this problem. Okay, so let's move but we, on. Luckily, we don't have that problem in Sardinia. Mm -hmm. So Thank we'll, you. Go, we'll go to Salento via Porto Cervo. Via Porto Cervo, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is maybe, I think this is the more controversial side because um, one of the problem um, with um, this garden was that I was really happy to start wo uh, working in Porto Cervo because the place where I needed that it was um, the opportunity to bring something new because uh, Porto Cervo was the places where um, the prevalent style is the one I show you at the beginning of this presentation. So this style, in fact, was born there and was created for those villas and uh, is almost the prevalent style. And what I found uh, is that at a certain point, uh, uh, working in this garden, I felt like uh, it was me that I was out of place, you know, uh, because I wanted to change the garden and to give to this garden a much more strictly Mediterranean and true Mediterranean uh, um, atmosphere, but suddenly found that uh, the greenery around me and uh, the gardens of the villas on the other side of the bay uh, were so um, imposing and were so everywhere that it was impossible to avoid having them uh, as a background of the garden. So the risk was that my garden looked like, um, my Mediterranean dry garden looked out of place in, in that particular environment. So again, the choice was to create a garden that was not um, using water in a non-wise way and try to introduce different plants of different kind with, uh, uh, which were less demanding in terms of water and also in terms of maintenance that were able to give a, a longer season of interest because the owners wanted to leave this house not only during um, during summer, but almost a year round, they in in the in the years later they came in for uh, for uh, Christmas and then for Easter time and then in the middle of winter again. And so they come and go from Milan to this place, and the more they found that this place is enjoyable or year round, the more they they come and stay longer and longer. So this is how the garden look like. The villa is a, is a very nice villa of one of the most famous architects that work in Porto Cervo. And as you can see, as these uh, uh, natural junipers, which are the remnants of the natural macchia. Uh, but again, the problem is that uh, uh, loan is used as a solution to fill uh, 
the garden because the gardeners uh, are too often convinced that loan is the easiest way to, to create a garden and also owners are convinced that is the easiest way to maintain to maintain a garden which is not of course um, and also there was a with the wrong grass so again it was changed and I also wanted to create a completely different feeling to this derelict area around the swimming pool. There were two enormous uh, um, pine trees, Pinus pinea. So you can see the, the soil covered in, with needles. And um, this is the, the swimming pool in the idea of the architects. And you can see there is no relationship with the sea here. And uh, at the beginning, the owners and uh, the architects asked me to put grass here again around the swimming pool. And I said, no, it, it, it's a complete nonsense, not only because this um, uh, area um, around the, the swimming pool is uh, at another level than the surrounding uh, soil, it's higher, it, this is a lower level, but also because you'll never use that area and you'd better feel like in the middle of a um, uh, natural environment. So I wanted to plant them. Uh, they're a kind of um, meadow, you know, as you can find sometimes in dunes um, in some areas of the island. Again, usually it's flower in spring, but I wanted that effect during the summer months. Uh, this is a rough sketch of the, um, of the garden, just to show you how it's in relationship with the villa. And the only patch of lawn I left is this one, uh, for a specific reason uh, i tell you later. And all those areas which was, were just barren earth under the junipers were replanted. And uh, again, this is the area with uh, the new flowering meadow some of the um, presentation watercolors. And this is how the swimming pool looks like now. This is the area that was um, planted with all those uh, Mediterranean shrubs, not really well cared for. And you can see that we cut down this, uh, um, this hedge of evergreens to, to show, uh, to better show the sea. And uh, the planting is, uh, uh, completely different from what they used to do in Porto Cervo because in Porto Cervo the effect is always instant effect. The people want to have their garden planted and it has to look lush immediately. Uh, what I wanted to do here, and uh, I thanks my clients to follow me in this choice, was to plant small at the right distance and in the right way. Here there is a mulch on, uh, on top of the soil and the irrigation system is underground, the sub irrigation system. Um, this is a, like a drip line, but it's uh, 20 centimeters below the surface of the soil. And this helps to uh, save water, a lot of water, because it gets the water at the level of the roots and uh, also avoid um, uh, the water flowing on the surface and also avoid the look of the, um, of the pies, which are usually very ugly. Uh, so this was the first uh, summer we planted in April, and this was, I think, in uh, June, maybe. And this, the, the following picture is just one year later. So all the spaces have been uh, filled with plants. And uh, the scattered flowering starts in uh, early April, and then there are plants going coming into flower in flushes all over the summer. And uh, the end of the, the flowering season is maybe in November again. So this is the, the overall effect. There are some parts, parts of the garden which serves as a, um, you know, as a passing through to other parts, parts of the garden, more uh, um, in the shadier parts with different kind of plantings. This is a, a, those are pictures taken in November, actually. 
the entrance, uh, I don't know if you remember the first picture um, I showed you before. Again, this is a basically a planting of uh, shrubs and sub-shrubs of typical Mediterranean macchia. And the areas underneath the junipers, you know the junipers are a very strong root system and it's quite difficult to, to have uh, greenery around them or, or below them. So I choose this, uh, this way of planting that give a very nice effect. Also for uh, areas which are not in um, at first sight. So this is a small patch of lawn. I, I told you before that um, lawn uh, is not an enemy. Uh, it can be used, uh, but in, it just um, have to be used on, uh, on the right amount, just not a solution for everything. And in this specific uh, um, case, I needed to have a, um, an open surface with nothing inside because I, I had the view to the sea, but also because my clients put here uh, the chaise long uh, to stay and to enjoy the sun and also the child to play. But this lawn has also a very important um, function because it absorbed the, the dust, which is one of the main uh, uh, problems in Mediterranean climates, like, uh, hot Mediterranean climates like in Sardinia. And sand coming from uh, um, the surrounding beaches, but also um, cools down the air, so it reduces the use of air conditioning inside the house and in outside areas of the of the house. So it it it, it makes those areas quite pleasant to stay, even in the afternoon. So my clients stay in the garden rather than inside a house with a hair conditioner on, on maximum uh, levels. And all those loans are reduced in size and the surrounding areas are planted in the same way I showed you before. Those plants are also uh, quite resilient because you have to think that um, when um, there is a mareggiata, Angela, please help me again. I tried, I tried. Yeah, okay. Um, those plants get damaged, sometimes very badly damaged, and they need to be able um, to resprout new leaves and new flowers in a very short time. And that's also a reason why I prefer to improve the quality of the soil, because without that improvement, it will be really difficult. A plant, a plant which is suffering for uh, growing in a very difficult condition it takes months to recover for a bad damage for uh, uh, wind or uh, even uh, you know a cold spell or something like that um, we don't never um, forget that natural plants took years or sometimes decades to grow as big as we saw them and in garden, this is completely different because their growth is forced in something unnatural. And about those hydrangeas that maybe look like uh, uh, the most non-Mediterranean plants, <laughs> they are um, a very common site in Porto Cervo and they grow very well there because um, the breeze in the afternoon uh, and 2 p.m. it starts a very light breeze from the sea and the air is fresh. This freshness in the air is enough for the plants to, to thrive and grow even if the soil is not really irrigated. You can find them even in abundant place which is quite um, astonishing if you want because you never expect to see an hydrangea of four meters wide and two meters and a half tall in a neglected space, but it happens, it happens quite often in Porto Cervo. So those uh, were originally in that area of the garden and I uh, left them there and just added some scattered plants in other part of the garden because they were so beautiful and so easy to grow in those conditions. And here you can see also the use of plants uh, quite commonly see as a house plants, like the, this Boston fern, 
the nephrol apis cordifolia, which is a, a plant that grows as an epiphytic and is quite, quite easy to grow for us. Some other uh, pictures of this garden, and I think it's done. Okay, um, let's, we're, we're quite, we're sort of running on, so uh, let's make questions and answers quick. Have we got any questions, uh, Yvonne? Just quickly to say, um, com uh, to confirm, it's acid soil here, is that right? Yeah, yeah, it's acidic soil, because granite is um, is a no has no lime on it, so it's completely acidic soil. Okay, and you chose not to um, go into uh, any of the local natural flora because things like um, um... You, you have to know that the local flora is basically limited to um, lentisk and junipers and myrtle. So we have this kind of uh, of shrubs as a as a bone of the garden, so they make the, the structure of the garden, but they don't make the uh, the real character of the of the garden. And we don't have to forget that it's quite difficult sometimes to grow um, those kind of plants from plants coming from uh, nurseries because they are usually forced. The myrtles, for instance, are plants that when you buy into a nursery and you plant them in, into your garden, they are very, very water demanding plants. We, we quite often uh, lose them because uh, people think they are uh, very drought resistant and they are not. In fact, in my property, they grow in the most humid places, uh, sometimes with feet in the water. Mm, fascinating, mm. thank you. Okay. Okay. So just quickly, I, I have to are go a little bit quick. Are we, not, are we not going to Salento then? We're going to Liguria. No. Just, just uh, quickly going to Liguria, just to show you um, a place with a very nice view mm. for clients that were not really involved into uh, gardening, but they wanted to have uh, a nice garden around the, their house. This is a terraced slope. Um, and again, here the potential was given by the fact that those terracing um, was creating layers of very good soil that was uh, created by the work of uh, farmers in, in the centuries. So we had the opportunity to grow um, plants of different kind there. And my idea was to give to my clients, again, different views of different clients, of different gardens, to enjoy from different parts of the house and also from top, the top of the house looking down. It's kind of a patchwork, um, kind of a patchwork uh, uh, garden. But I quickly showing you this just to um, Underline again the fact that uh, the possibilities in Mediterranean gardens of creating plants, palettes with different feelings is literally endless. So for instance, this is a path leading to the house and it was uh, uh, planted uh, also um, using the fact that you can see it from below. So the terracing gives you this different point of view you can look at, at the plant composition from the top or from the bottom of the terracing. And this is quite interesting. Um, and again, the Algerian irises. Uh, this garden was especially uh, planned for winter interest. So there is a lot of plants that flower uh, in the winter months because of the difficulties in moving through the garden because of the slopes during winter the owners just peck through the, um, the entrance and avoid touring the garden in other parts, like they do in, uh, in spring and summer. But there is always something uh, interesting uh, there. And you can see from this picture that show you um, the, the before and after how the garden um, has changed. This is the, the main terrace, for instance. And again, you can see typical Mediterranean plants like uh, this is the, the sea fennel, the Critmon maritimum, which I use a lot. 
because when I was a child, I wanted to have something that was reminding me of the Alchemilla Mollis, you know, the ladies' mantle. Mm. There is uh, always uh, in, uh, in the English mixed border, I had to find a substitute. So <laughs> the Critmum is my Alchemilla. Um, just again, here, of course, is really important the relationship also uh, between the garden and uh, the landscape. But look at this again. It, that was a, um, um, as you can say, um, a trial for a, a flower meadow that ended into a disaster. So my clients wanted to have flower meadow, but didn't talk about the fact that uh, uh, flower in the fields uh, grow because the fields are rotated in each year. So poppies and uh, um, and uh, centaureas and so on, they grow uh, for that um, for that reason. So I wanted to create for them uh, the effect of the flower meadow, but again in the same style as before, but with a different uh, different concept. Uh, I wanted to show you this garden just because this garden is kept by one gardener that come on a monthly basis for two days. So no more than this. And of course, is a gardener, uh, which is a specialized garden, gardener. He knows the plants. He knows how to keep them. And, um, also, he knows what the, uh, the intention uh, in the design. So it follows my instruction to keep the design and the balance of the plants in the different areas of the optimum. But it's a, we can say it's a low maintenance garden, even if it looks like a, a really high maintenance garden, but it's not. So it's we are in Salento. <laughs> Do you want to go to Salento directly? Uh, yeah, I think so, because obviously people, we are now at 7.30, so... Yeah, yeah um, we go quick. We, we're in danger of maybe a little bit of overload, too much Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Okay, so that's San Gregorio. This is a very difficult place. We are in the, uh, in the very bottom of the... Um, we are on the hill of the, um, of the boot in, uh, in Salento. Uh, and we are also... On a, on, a, on a cliff overlooking the, the sea. And um, this is a very difficult place, not because of the wind and of the salty area um, air, but also because we are in the area which is subject to xylella limiting. You know that xylella is devastating uh, uh, the, net, the cultivated landscape in, um, in Puglia, and this is a place where we have a lot of limitation, not only because uh, of the um, of the climate, but also for that uh, that reason. And um, this area uh, was cultivated once for uh, uh, quite early product of vegetables, um, like in the middle of winter because of the climate. So there were terracing that were completely destroyed. Um, during the renovation of the house. They uh, brought uh, uh, stones and uh, um, other building materials and all the areas surrounding the house was like you can see here. And the project that was given to the owner was again uh, by the architects uh, loan everywhere. So uh, in a place where there is no water, uh, they suggest to put loan everywhere. Uh, what we suggested, because this uh, project I made it in collaboration with Margaret Scaramella, um, we decided to create different filtering zones to try to block the effect of the wind of the salty area, but also to create interest with textures of plants uh, basically on gravelly uh, um, area. So it's uh, like a huge gravel garden with plants uh, in different um, combinations in the different areas of the garden. And this is how the, the garden looks like now. Um, this garden was planted in uh, at the beginning of 2019. 
and now it looks like this. The plants have grown uh, very quickly because of the soil preparation I told you before. And uh, they also are able to withstand some uh, uh, very bad damage given by the wind or even by some other uh, climate accident by growing again quite, quite uh, quickly. And different, again, different areas of the garden with different combinations of plants. Uh, the idea was to have, again, something uh, of interest all year round. And one of the terraces, uh, uh, which is shown here, that just on top of the cliff, uh, was replanted as a um, small cultivation of capers, uh, just to remember the whole use of this part um, of the property. And that's all. <laughs> Oh. Well, it looks absolutely stunning and so developed so very quickly. Mm. Yeah, but that was because of the preparation of the soil. And uh, so we took the good, um, uh, you know, the English saying, uh, you have to spend 10 for plant and one for the plant. So um, again, we try to, to follow that rule. That, that's my main rule, maybe. I always uh, suggest to my clients to uh, spend their money for uh, irrigation system and, and preparation of the soil rather than planting huge specimens because a smaller plant will grow bigger and healthier in, in that kind of soil rather than just stuck in the middle of, uh, of a dry or a not um, on a style environment. Well, um absolutely fantastic are there any questions from that last garden um, uh, it, um, Maurizio if you unshare your screen now yeah can we get back the platea everybody we can then see everyone again uh, it was absolutely breathtaking for me I, I, I you know that I've, I've got a, a prejudice I've seen some of these gardens in reality and and you know just the quantity of plants that you are able to put in and how well thought out the planting schemes are is, is always just uh, miraculous. And, and you saw there a big variety of, of, uh, of um, situations, which you're- Yeah, on. but I think that one of the opportunities given by a wide plant palette is to um, being able to find the right um, group of plants for each different corner. So you can have different solution because just you have 10 plants and you change two and there is a new uh, feeling in that composition so i think this is one of the um, the funny part of the of our works of our work and also um, the way we are able to give to each client something which is like you know tailored yeah. effect so a design which is just um designed for them, which is not the repetition of, uh, of something uh, like a copy and paste and you can see in, uh, in every single garden. Mm -hmm. Right. Fantastic. Well, um, I think that at that point we can say grazie mille. And um, thank you to everybody for joining. Thank you, Maurizio, again. And- uh, Grazie, I'll... Maurizio. Ciao. Ciao, uh, oh, grazie mille. Grazie mille. Thank ciao, ciao. You. Thank you. Grazie, grazie, ciao. Grazie, Angela. Prego, prego, grazie. And alla ciao. prossima. Alla prossima. Alla prossima. Ciao. Grazie. Ciao, grazie. Grazie, Alessandro, per ciao. essere con noi. Ciao, Maurizio. Ciao, Angela. Ciao, ciao. Ciao, ciao. Ciao, ciao. 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 ciao.